welcome to Newsmakers for inside analysis and behind the scenes commentary from Santa Barbara's top journalists and political leaders about the most important news events in our community. I'm Jerry Roberts. Tonight, we look behind these headlines. Advocates charge the city is waging a war on the homeless with new efforts to clean up the streets. City college trustees pick a new leader to tackle a raft of troublesome and volatile problems. Candidates on the east side and the Mesa race to the finish in the final days before the city council election. And later in our political remix segment, we'll hear the panel's predictions for the November 5th election and the latest buzz about 2020 campaign. Our panel tonight, Josh Molina, who covers politics and policy for NewsHawk. Delaney Smith, reporter and editor for the Santa Barbara Independent. And Fire and Police Commissioner Lizzie Rodriguez. Thank you all for coming. So Josh, uh, there's been a whole bunch of ordinances kicking around about sort of cracking down on shopping carts and personal belongings, but now the Salvation Army uh, has withdrawn its plan to build 14 uh, units on the east side for formerly homeless people. Um, what's going on? Why, why is all this kind of seemingly anti-homeless uh, stuff coming up now? Right, so we'll talk about the ordinances, but first, sort of the, the latest, the breaking news, the Salvation Army has decided to abandon its plan to build permanent supportive housing on the east side. And this is in direct response to the community outrage and backlash that they received. Um, they said that they don't want to do this, that it's not worth it. They are trying to get this grant money, this HEAP grant money, and they want to move forward. And they know that this is going to be a long community battle. So they just sort of cut their ties and said, okay, community, you talk about wanting homeless services, but you don't want them here. So let's go focus on all the other good work we do in the community. And you can deal with the homeless issue in a different way. So that was the big news this week. They said, we're done, we're out of it. Now, the city of Santa Barbara and city attorney Ariel Colon is working to shape some ordinances that have a huge impact on the homeless. They want an ordinance that requires grocery store owners to take back their shopping carts. Uh, lots of abandoned shopping carts all over Santa Barbara. Homeless people use them for their things. And so they want to figure out a way to require big operators to take them back. It's part of the visual clutter, but it hurts Santa Barbara's reputation when there's lots of shopping carts, there's tourism, of course the downtown businesses are not happy. In addition to that, they're saying, hey, if you keep your belongings on the sidewalk for more than four hours, we're gonna go in there and take it. And that one is also controversial. Uh, the city kind of hit a roadblock with the shopping carts this week. The ACLU sent them a letter and said, stop. And so they withdrew it from the council meeting. You watch a council. So I haven't heard this sentiment, this general sentiment, which could be characterized as anti-homeless, from anybody on the council, with the possible exception of Randy once in a while. Wh where is this coming from? Is this just coming up from the bowels of the bureaucracy, or does the business community have a side door in, or what's going on? Um, the business communities definitely have a side door in. I mean, especially when we're talking about lower state, like, yes, the city has played a role in making it difficult for businesses to prosper, but um, business owners have time and time again complained about homeless people being in front of their businesses and scaring off customers. Um, it's more of a statewide issue, though. Homelessness is a California problem. So this is just finally kind of trickling down here to Santa Barbara, and they're throwing ordinances at it, trying to make it work. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if they're the best ordinances. Yeah, I mean, it all <laughs> sounds like a lot of work for the cops. Uh, and I, I mean, think don't they already have a very high percentage of uh, response calls about these kinds of issues? Yes, and this would this would be considered one of the low priority calls. So the, the there, there's four levels of response calls for the police and homeless in front of a business would not be considered a high priority call because it's not life threatening. And I think Delaney, you made a very good point. This is a statewide issue. I think the reason why these ordinance are, is ordinances are being created is because folks have been asking, business owners have been asking the police to do something about the homeless issue. Being homeless in itself is not illegal. The, the actions that homeless um, do because they don't have homes like drinking in the streets or 
urinating in public um, or loitering, those things are illegal, but they're only illegal because they don't have a home to go to. If, remember a few months back too, this isn't actually just coming now. I mean, when they took the benches and they either took the benches away or put the railings on there so that homeless people couldn't lay down and sleep on them, um, this is just kind of rebubbling to the surface, but it's not the first time. It kind of seemed like uh, around the margins uh, ways of addressing the issue. Um, I mean, uh, how big a deal is this Salvation Army thing quitting? Because that seemed to be like a, a, a substantive real thing. This is, you know, kind of a strategy that we could pursue. The fact that it got driven out of town basically is a, it's not a good sign. Well, the Salvation Army project is a big deal because it's part of the overall narrative of what's happening throughout the city. The east side feels as though it's been targeted by these high density housing projects. And for them, they feel as it's another example of the city of Santa Barbara trying to solve its problems in their neighborhood, in their community. The homeless issue has been ongoing. It's not going away. Uh, Ariel Colon, he's more of an activist attorney than the previous city attorney, yeah. mm -hmm. than previous city attorneys back in old days. <coughs> you know, back in your the days, the, maybe the days oh, of stop. <laughs> the early days, or you know, when we worked together at the News Press, Dan no, Wallace, that is the old days. <laughs> city attorney Steve Wiley, yeah. they were invisible. They would talk very rarely during council meetings, and they would speak only when the council got a little bit uh, off. The rails. Does that, does that reflect a frequent commentator during meetings? Does that reflect uh, a lack of assertiveness on the part of the mayor and the council? Yeah, it reflects a novice council, and it reflects a council that is more concerned about saying what they think is the right thing to please their party backing, as opposed to back then there was less of that. You had more people experienced who were speaking their mind. There's a lack of leadership on the city council. Paul Casey, the, the city, city administrator, the city administrator uh, he is the one who controls sort of everything. And the council members are just sort of doing their political sort of posturing. There's a vacuum. So Ariel's got to do more. Paul Casey has to do more. The leadership that's happening from those seven is political. It's not necessarily on an issue by issue basis. But it's not substantive. Right. It's symbolic. <coughs> All right. All right, so the city col uh, college trustees, uh, Delaney, voted unanimously in picking a new president of the college. Um, I mean, you couldn't get all those people to vote together to get to order lunch. I mean, what, <laughs> I how does they must really <laughs> like this guy? Who, who is he? Um, so he was the candidate who's coming from Kansas City. Um, I was a little bit surprised they picked him as well, actually, uh, just because during the public forums, Kenneth Lawson was a lot more laid back. He was walking around the stage. He was more loose with his answers. And Dr. Zaswami was more very just formal, and, and his answers were direct and to the point. But I think the reason he was picked is with his fiscal experience. Um, he talked about his fundraising experience. He's raised I mean, over $20 million for programs in the past at other colleges he's worked for. And Right now, at this time of budget cuts in California, that's what we need. We need someone who knows how to pull in funds from elsewhere to make up for it. So that's so really it. Do you think that was the difference? I think that was much more the difference. Um, Dr. Lawson also, as well, he wasn't a president before. He was a vice president, so he didn't have as much experience. When it came to the fiscal questions, he seemed a little less experienced. Um, yeah, I think that he... So, so the fiscal stuff is going to be more important than the kind of racial issues that we heard a lot about last year that you, for example, reported on um, at, yeah. at great length. <laughs> I mean, I is mean, that just sort of fading away now? Or? I don't think it's fading away at all, at least from the public forum, because, of course, we don't really know what the trustees talked about because this all happened in closed session. But during the public forums, um, I think Dr. Zaswami was really surprised because he started off his spiel by saying, you know, oh, I've read in the newspapers about all this bad stuff what happening newspaper? here. <laughs> right. Um, he's like, I've been reading about all this bad stuff. He's like, but I believe that y this college is 99% good and it's only the 1% that we're really hearing about. And I think he was proven wrong pretty quickly. Um, I think saying that as an outsider who's not even from the state definitely wasn't the right move because uh, 
he got five, six, seven questions from the audience that were all about equity. This all is about the guy nation. they picked or not the guy? That's the guy they picked. Um, so I think he was a little taken aback. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, that's, that's why I was a little surprised he was picked. But at the same time, he did reference um, that at his college that he came from in Kansas City, they had every year, they had annual um, equity climate surveys, very similar to the one that we just had for the first time Which at City didn't College. Come out so well. Ours came out really poorly. Um, his, supposedly, his colleges were getting better every year after year. So whatever he was doing there seemed to be working, but he did not um, elaborate at all publicly about what that was. So Josh, what is the uh, <laughs> mood of the faculty uh, at, City, <laughs> at City College? I mean, does this guy have any idea uh, what he's in for? I guess, I mean, they are, are people, I mean, your colleagues, do they, do they think it's a good pick or do they, not think about it too much, or it was pretty disruptive I, I, year. I, I can't speak of the mood of the faculty, but oh, I think, sure you can. I think that Goswami <laughs> was the more experienced and on paper most qualified, and it's probably a case where they interviewed on a public stage at the Garvin Theater, and it's a presentation, it's a show, and it's probably a case where Goswami maybe didn't present as well as Lawson did. But when it came to actual experience, interviewing, talking, um, he was on paper more qualified. I don't think anyone knows what they're walking into. They possibly can't. Uh, just like the superintendent of the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Santa Barbara's a culture, and you may think you understand how things work from wherever you came from, but we're so unique, and we've seen lots of super important people, super intelligent people, fail in this community because they assume, they think they know it all, they over, they underestimate the importance of getting to know people and having relationships. You're, 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 you're shaking your head. Do you agree with Josh's mansplaining here? I don't think Josh is mansplaining at this point. Well, give it a few minutes that he may. However, there you go. <laughs> there it is. However, I think he, he, is, he is speaking what's true about our community. It's very unique. We have unique challenges. I think from what I understand, all of the top candidates for this position all had um, significant equity backgrounds. So, so that was one of their number one criteria. I think in order for someone to succeed, they need to have a combination of being able to affirm um, people's experience, um, reflect back what they shared, and then also have concrete procedures and um, policy in place. And I'm not sure that either the interim or the former had a combination of both of those. So you think this guy will succeed where others have failed? How long will he be here? Uh, What's the over under on Man, that? that's tough. Um, How long is his contract for? Three years? That w is still yeah. under um, discussion. They're discussing that, I believe, November 12th, but don't quote me on that. But coming up uh, midway through November, we they're going to be just anyone, <laughs> they're gonna be discussing the details of his contract and he actually starts in his position in January. So we don't know yet. Do we know how much he's getting paid? That's all going to be discussed this month. Um, January, that should all be released. But I, I think he has a chance, at least when he does talk about his, his equity climate surveys um, and they getting better and better at his school before. I mean, that's a concept that our college had never even well, like never even heard of until problem. like over the summer. Yeah, so at least he comes from a background of that being important. Although he didn't elaborate on it publicly, he has, he has some kind of knowledge if he's been doing these regular uh, surveys. So I, I think there's right, a chance. You heard it there. Delaney says there's no way this guy fails. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> write that down. <laughs> October 23rd. She'll, she'll be at the New York Times by then. Don't worry about it. Oh. Or else Nick will be working for her. That could be the <laughs> other way it goes. Oh, Nick Welsh on special assignment tonight. <laughs> so Lizzie, uh, just a couple days left before the November 5th election. Well, there's no election because all you have to do is um, mail in your ballot except for those people who don't know how to Mail click in. an envelope. But um, so who looks the, strong, who well looks the strongest say, on think, District 1 and 2? I think there's district envy going on in Santa Barbara because yeah. there's only two, um, two districts that are voting. You see a lot of, of signs for um, 1 and 2 in other districts. Yeah. So I think that there's, um, there's other, so if it was a large city election, I think there would be a huge turnout, but because there's only two districts, there are other districts rooting for, for, their, for their favorites. And from what I can tell around town, um, 
Jason Dominguez has a lot of lawn signs in his own community. Alejandra has a lot of lawn signs outside of her community. Really? Terry <laughs> Jory has plenty, both in and yeah. outside of her community. Also in her front yard. And have and you driven up there? I have, and the, the animals love her even. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, uh, social media photographs with animals saying, vote for Terry Jory. You know, I just see this guy camel everywhere. I mean, he's got, he's bought ads all over, you know, News Hawk and... I know where he's not bought ads. Well, it's, yeah, well, he pulled them out of the independent, but um, Ed Hat, he had a piece on Ed Hat today uh, with his Howard Beale spiel about uh, homelessness. He got a huge reaction. Do you, do you think he's got a chance or do you think he's just a spoiler for Jordan, Mike Jordan, <coughs> in, in on the Mesa? I think if he wants to win a seat on the city council, he needs to hook up with some people who know how to run campaigns, who know how to package and market him. Uh, he, he speaks to a large amount of people who agree with him. But it's hard to break through the, the Democratic uh, sort of machine. And we're probably going to see a Democrat win that seat. Um, you can have great ideas and you can... So a Democrat being Mike Jordan or Terry Jordan? Is I mean, yeah, I mean is Mike Jordan really a Democrat? He's endorsed by the Democrat. That's kind? true, but he just registered as Democrat for this election. So did Oscar. But <laughs> and Oscar's going to be the mayor. True. <laughs> you heard it here first. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Joe. So so, so yes. So Brian you Cap think it's Jordan or? I mean, there's a couple possibilities. There's a whole bunch of people who like Terry Jory. There's a whole bunch of people who like Mike <coughs> Jordan. There's some who like Tavis. There's some who like Luis. Those are all uh, liberal, moderate liberals. If they all split the vote and Brian Campbell just has the conservative vote, maybe he does better than we think. Uh, but I think conventional wisdom says it's coming down to Jory and Jordan. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think Jordan does have a conservative base as well. Mm -hmm. So he's moderate enough that he can be he's on both. He, he, he's afraid, though. He thinks Campbell's pulling votes from him. He, he, I mean, he is concerned. Well, he is definitely him. pulling votes. The, the Jordan is endorsed by the Democratic Party, which in that district might hurt him because Randy Rouse has been the elected official. Right. And uh, Randy Rouse is... I don't know how he's registered, but he's way more conservative mm -hmm. than anyone else on the city council. And uh, he is somebody they like, and he's kind of fits that mode. So you, he's endorsed by the Democrats, works on the west side, works on the east side, uh, not as well on the Mesa. But I still think bottom line is they have canvassers, they have people walking, they have people making phone calls. Mm -hmm. If you're a Democrat and you don't really care who it is, you're just going to vote for the Democratic. So is that going to be true on the east side? Yeah, the Alejandra Gutierrez has the endorsement. Uh, Jason is uh, on the outs with the party, long has been. Is that going to make a big difference? I don't think the Democratic endorsement is really going to make a big difference on the east side, actually. But I, I do still, and I know that my opinion might be contested a little bit, but I do feel like Alejandra is going to win this. Um, but not not because of her endorsement. I feel like she's going to win just because the East Side has historically had such a low voter turnout, um, and she's made it a point to educate people about how to register to vote, how to vote. She's made the deadlines for mailing ballots in really public. Um, she works with her cons potential constituents <laughs> in the district all the time at her job at the Franklin Center, and she tells people day in day out, "This is how you vote. This is what you do." This is why it's important, blah, 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 Like, just she hammers it into people, and she's gone door to door eight, nine hours a day for weeks on end every weekend. So I really think that she might actually get it. So Jason <laughs> was doing a touchdown dance about the Salvation Army project uh, being shot down, even though the night they had the big hearing, you couldn't tell where he was on it. Is that going <laughs> to be a big issue? Do you, I mean, is it going to be a voting issue for people? You know, I think um, I think for the folks that live in the, the east side um, district, I, I don't think that's going to be um, the turning point for them. And actually, I'm going to go opposite and say that I have a feeling Jason's going to win. He's a familiar name. He's a familiar vote. And um, while Alejandra might be well known and endorsed by the Democratic Party, I think that uh, I think the East Side is pretty satisfied with with Jason, and that's I mean, but that's the thing about district election. Nobody knows nothing because the the, the universe of voters is so small that that almost um, anything can happen. 
Does it, do people know on the east side that Jason's running for two offices at the same time, that he's, that he's going to be on I'm the sure ballot? I'm sure it's the first thing out of Alejandro's mouth. Mm -hmm. You so think it is? I, I mean, it's it. definitely a play. I just don't think they care. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you don't? I agree. Well, mm -hmm. I think that, that po political people care and journalists care. But I think in that community, people care more about how you come across one-on-one. -on -one. And if Jason looks you in the eye and tell you, I want to serve the city council, but I also have an opportunity to serve the city council. But he doesn't say that. He well, just says, oh, I mean, I'm running for, right? Uh, uh, yeah, no, I, well, you go. Uh, one oh, on one, I'll, I'll, I, will go, I will follow up on that. One on one, one, he does say that. He says, I am committed for you um, in this role, and there's also a lot of work to do on a larger scale, and I can do that as well. I think, I think the thing that Jason has in his favor is that he has addressed the issues that are important for his constituents. That's homeless, parks, and housing. Those are the three things that he's been really pounding on for several years. And so while, um, while the Salvation Army home would have been perfect, the way that he um, opposed it was saying <coughs> it's not great for the folks who live no, here. He opposed it by saying it was toxic waste dump or something. Yeah, that, 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 that was, was a little. I mean, that, no, that shook me when I, 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 I heard that. That was, that was a gnarly comparison <laughs> to make to compare human beings to, to a toxic waste dump. Um, but the difference is, especially with this election being the mail in ballot, um, a lot of the East Side, I mean, Jason won last time with hundreds of votes. So. <laughs> Like a lot of East Side constituents, they're not going to be actually taking the time to fill out a mail in, val mail in ballot unless someone tells them, hey, this is how you do it. Here it is. And Jason isn't doing that. Alejandro is legitimately going door to door and giving, putting it into people's hands and telling them this is how you do it. And working in that, A, she grew up in that community, but B, working in the schools in that community for 20 years. She knows parents. She knows kids who've grown up and graduated. She's been like, hey do this, this is why it's important. So that's mm -hmm. why I really think this is going to be different this time. I think, I think that if, if the voters that don't normally vote, because I think you're right, the folks who she um, serves in the community are typically the voters that do not right. vote. Right. Yeah. They may be eligible, some may be undocumented, but they're receiving services in the community through her, so she's a familiar and trusted face. However, they tend to not be the engaged citizens who, who vote. So if she's able to get them to turn in their ballot, then yes. Yeah, sure. All right, but you're, predict, you pre, you're predicting Jason I'm will predicting win. Jason. You're predicting Alejandro. Mm -hmm. Josh, break the tie it's and then I'll make it again. It's going to be really close. Oh. <laughs> oh. But <coughs> he mansplained. But yes. conventional wisdom says Jason's going to keep his seat. And Why? should he and then get elected um, elsewhere, it would be a, a great appointment for Alejandro. So if he loses, that's true. If he loses, well, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. If he loses, does that does that just destroy his he chances no of, chance be, of, of being no elected to the assembly? The then, assembly seat, whether he wins or loses. You know, I spent some time with your man uh, Jonathan Abood today, mm -hmm. running for the assembly, and uh, you, you might be onto something there by by predicting him early on that he's going to be. Oh, now, you, now, now you agree I, with me. I'm, I'm just saying you now. might. Okay. You might be. You might be. All right, By the way, that's no reflection on Jason's qualifications, but the Democratic Party endorsed candidate after the primary is going, I mean, it's going to be a boot or Kathy Maria. It's going to be one of those. After the primary. Yeah. After the primary. It has to be. I mean, it would be a stunner if it wasn't. All right. All right. What about District uh, 2? What about on the Mesa? Now, uh, by the way, uh, check tomorrow's... Um, uh, newsmakers blog and you'll get all the details about our special pick the winners of district 2 contest with amazing great prizes just uh, send us an email with the uh, 1 through 5 order that you forecast of the candidates as well as the tiebreaker how many people will vote uh, what's what's your take on district 2 who's gonna win or yeah, what's going yeah, on there yeah. Well, it's going to be between Jory and Jordan. Yeah, we knew that. <laughs> so Except m unless it's not. Yeah. If Jory doesn't win the election, she should definitely win a prize for most hardworking candidate. So you think Mike's going to win? I think if it's a citywide election, Mike Jordan comes in number one. I think Terry Jory is going to surprise people. I can't call it. It's too close to call. But I think Terry Jory probably has the edge right now. And Mike's going to have to work really hard between now and Election Day. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Terry Jory. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm going to go more kind of like Josh said, yes, if it was a citywide election, Michael Jordan would win 100%. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's been on several commissions in the past. He has experience. But again, with this district election thing, Terry Jory is really well known on the Mesa. And, mm -hmm. and she, I mean, sh I've never heard of someone campaigning so hard for such a small <laughs> local seat. But yeah. <laughs> so, the, so the homeless issue <laughs> on the Mesa is not that big a deal that Campbell would, could, could break through. I think the people who are conservative are going to vote for Campbell no matter what. And the homeless, all the homeless are by 7-Eleven <laughs> and City College. I don't think there's a lot of, I mean, I don't live there, but yeah, I don't think that's the resonating issue on the Mesa. All right, we got to leave it there. So uh, thank you to Josh Molina, Lizzie Rodriguez, and Delaney Smith. Thank you all for watching. Please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com. <laughs> Find my blog posts on politics and media in Santa Barbara and oh, beyond. Okay, keep it on. Okay. And <laughs> should your insomnia be particularly gnarly, check out our YouTube channel, where you'll find an archive of past shows and interviews, including <laughs> our four special <laughs> programs on the campaigns yeah, for city bad. council. And finally, don't forget to enter the special contest to predict the results in the city council race on the Mesa. You'll find details on our site. Thanks again to our director, J.P. Montalvo, and to our crew, Brandon, Frank, Ryan, Mark, and as always, our senior, top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy executive producer, Pat Freund. Thanks and have a happy Halloween. <laughs>